So when you saw this change take place within yourself, um, do you find that it could be with all meditation practices or did you find that this was one of the meditation practices that really helped to create this natural change with no effort, but you could just see this personality, you know, changing? Yeah, well, I guess, uh, I mean, my I'd read parts of at that time in the Kimberley of um, formerly Rajneesh, Bhagwan Rajneesh, before he became, before it was Osho, now it's Osho. Um, and I loved the, the teachings at that time. I read many of his books, Books of Secrets and that, and that was good. And then I saw people in Australia at that time, it was quite popular, this is in the early 80s. Um, and yet I think... Not that I, I dis disregarded any of those, but I, I guess it just happened naturally because I'd had that experience in the, in the Kimberley that this image of light, that was the main thing, and this concentration that um, I realized um, probably the concentration part was the most... Because it was almost like I felt, okay, you get a magnifying glass, you put it in the sun, and you get that point where you actually focus and it, it, you have to leave it there for a length of time before it starts burning and I felt that it's like if I can get to this state of concentration and that meant that of course all the other thoughts in the mind of you know like if we're caught up in something else that's really in the back of our mind we can't concentrate we find it we'll start and then we'll you know, our mind will go back to that thing, but we don't actually concentrate it. So I guess all the teachings in the sense of karma, of our actions, of, you know, what is, you know, um, um, our karma or positive action and all this, and all these things I understood that they all helped in that process of concentration. Like the whole lifestyle was geared that it maximized... Um, um, your ability for that concentration. Otherwise, it's like could be caught up in many, many different things. So we we don't get that time. And of course, one of the things I really love with it was like you didn't have to sit in any particular way. You could do meditation while you're walking, while you're moving around, while you're doing ac action or activity. And of course, with the eyes open. So it meant that meditation just wasn't for that time you're sitting, but it was for your whole life. Yeah. So it's like a, med a meditation throughout the day for everything you do, concentration on everything you do. Uh, but if you're sitting, then enjoy that yeah. time off. If you're meditating, yeah. enjoy that. If you're cooking, enjoy that as a meditation. And uh, David, you know, you mentioned about the Brahma Kumari teachings. You've been living here for 22 years in Mount Abu, which is beautiful. I can hear the birds singing in the background. We have a beautiful, majestic mountains opposite your home <laughs> where you're staying even your home has a beautiful wonderful history behind it of how it was built and is it a wonderful dome I can see it's a lovely shape already you know I think conducive to spiritual growth can you tell me a little bit more about you know your 22 years of why you decided to stay here in India and follow the Brahma Kumari uh, teachings um, yeah well I mean I remember coming here and the, firstly, in um, to this particular campus. I mean, I, be, I was coming here since 1986, the first time in Mount Abu, and then in um, and every year in 1986. And I used to come and I used to share the artwork I was doing and the style I was painting with to the Indian artists here. And airbrush was hardly even heard of here at that time. And of course, even painting painting on canvases, most of the artists here would paint on plywood. So when I'd come, I brought canvas, and of course you could bring large pieces of canvas so you could paint large pictures without any joins, as they would join the plywood, stick all the plywood pieces together. So um, I'd come here like that, and then um, and when this campus of Gyan's Rover started, and I end up staying here in this, what they call solar house, um, of course... I'd, I'd stayed, so I'd stay for six months of the year for the first two years, six months here, six months in Australia, and then it become like eight months here, ten months here, less time in Australia, then more and more here. So I never was really surrendered here like the Indian Nawasis here um, as such, but I've always been here. So it's like, it was almost like very sort of easy way of just coming into the place and I think because I was doing that service of painting and and 
and a lot of the centres really liked the pictures, so I had many, many um, requests for paintings for centres throughout India. And of course, India being the, the hub or the, the foundation of, of, of Raj Yoga, the Brahma Kumaris, um, of course, the, the, the amount of students here is hundreds of thousands, whereas in the West, it's just literally, you know, up to 10,000 at that time, not, probably not even that, actually, at that time. And, um, and of course, my sanskaras were really of like, um, I guess that time in the Kimberley was really like I, when I came first to India and I saw the sannyasis and these, these sadhus, I was really like that at that time, you know, long hair, long beard, you know, sort of. So when I come to India, I really connected with them, really. I, I could somehow, I knew their style, the whole sort of thing of the, the sadhus and that. So, um, it was easy to stay here. And of course, um, having the experience of being isolated and, and, and away from other things, of course, language here, even though I don't really speak Hindi fully, even still now, but I was used to that time in solitude and that. So coming here was sometimes in the summer season, it was a bit like Sanyas as well for a foreigner, because there's no other foreigners. <laughs> You're the only foreigner here. So, but because I've had that experience and was comfortable living alone or living sort of in isolated, it was easy to stay here. So even they sometimes they come up to me to Bharat was here and say, Aren't you afraid living up here, this side of the property? You know, like there's no one else around, and you know, you, and of course they don't know my history of living right up in the Kimberley with all animals around and all these things. So, um, I mean, so it, it sounds very much like you yourself are like one of the yogis, you know, like an Indian lo yogi. This is a very similar kind of experiences that they go through because they go and live alone. Mm -hmm. They live in the caves. They live in the Himalayas. They can live wherever they can find, you know, isolation. And then they try to connect and go through that spiritual path. Sometimes it's about searching what is the meaning of life, and sometimes it's about connecting to the um, the, the inner self. It's sometimes self reflection. There are various reasons that mm. they would go, but they always end up finding that there is a higher power of some sort. Um, and sometimes even by being isolated, uh, be able to uh, get command of their own bodies, <laughs> yeah, you know, because yeah. that discipline all of a sudden, it's like a real life training, practical mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. And by going through those experiences, I think sometimes you go through the invisible experiences, which people may not be able to see, but you can definitely experience, uh, which may be hard to describe, you know, to others who may not have been through the same types of experiences. Um, so coming here, if somebody else wanted to perhaps learn a little bit more about the Brahma Kumari teachings, maybe not all of them would be, you know, um, a lot of them would be family members, they could be people living in society, they could be professionals, they could be students, people who are living really quite heavily in everyday life in the humdrum of <laughs> busy lifestyles. <clears throat> How would the Brahma Kumari teachings help them? Um. Well, it's the thing is, it's for everyone because it's it's spiritual knowledge. So everyone, being spirit or soul, they can uh, relate to any part of the knowledge. I mean, and of course, it's 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 in a way where it's very practical in our everyday life, as far as you know, the attitude, vision. We can all adopt these things and and progress through that. Um, I think sort of because sometimes people come to me and say, "Oh, you know, I'm in a family situation. I have this, this, and this, and this." Well, we have our everyone has their own situation or own part, but how we come as, of course, how we practice that knowledge in how we come is very still very um, valid, as you could say. You don't have to be a sannyas, or you don't have to go into the isolation like I did. That was my part. And even that part when I came here, that was my dream from that experience in the Kimberley was to, wouldn't it be lovely to be in a place where you could come amongst all the people or you could retreat to this place of solitude as well, like even physically, like in a physical location. Because I find that the things with creativity and all these, there's a time, there's time you need space alone to develop that and practice that where no one else is around. And I, that's been my part with this too. A lot of times being spent where there's been no one around to play. And I remember even with the music and things, you know, if somebody was around, I just wouldn't play until no one was, I made sure no one was around, then I would play, you know, and something. <laughs> so all these things. So that was very important to me to have that space. 
Um, but the teachings, um, I find that sort of, I mean, whatever we have to learn, we're always in the best place wherever we are to learn that. So our situation, if we're in the family, if we have, um, you know, husband, wife, family, kids, all this sort of thing, whatever we have to learn spiritually is, is completely appropriate for the, t for the, place where we're in at this time right. for everyone so it's individualistic yeah. Yeah. for people they can literally um, uh, bring on board these principles and values and whatever place you're at at that moment in time you can incorporate these uh, principles in your lifestyle <laughs> yeah um final question you do these beautiful paintings and I've seen them all over, you know, displayed, not just here in India, in all the various conference rooms and various exhibition uh, rooms here, but also in, in London. Mm. Um, there are beautiful paintings that are displayed on the walls and very, very stunning. And most of them have this light as well that you talk about, which is mm. literally almost in all of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or you have may have personalities like yeah. all the Dadi Jang, you know, like different yeah. Dadis and Didis that you say sisters here um can you tell me a little bit about to finish off uh, you know uh, what does it mean to you to be someone who's had this i don't know maybe an opportunity even through your spirituality uh, to be able to bring joy to so many thousands and thousands and millions of people through your paintings how does that make you feel well i guess you know i when I started this, it was through, I felt that time in the, in the Kimberley where it was like a godly gift in that sense. It was like really a gift, those things of music and art. So, um, my journey with these, I think like with, I think many artists I see, um, musicians, when you're first starting off, you, you want to be heard naturally. And then you could have the, you could have like ego of this side as well, where, you know, like, I guess when there's any desire for something. So I've been through those, that process of that. Yeah. So when, you know, if you wanted, really want to do something or you want to be listened to and that. And, and I was thinking, well, um, it is a gift. And then I remember sort of having the experience also that like this thing of attainments that this divine source has given me this gift. And then it's like to share that gift. And I guess sort of, the experiences really being of just being an instrument. And, and when I had this experience of really being just an instrument, it was like if somebody said to me, like praised you for this, or this is so nice, or this or this, or internally there would be this thanks to this divine source for that, not actually for me, because it was like I really felt it was a gift. So I guess that's been a protection in that sense as, in that sense as well, because it means that Okay, it is a as a as a fantastic gift. It's it's special and many things like that. But I guess sort of um, having that first thought that this is this divine source is giving me. Um, I guess it's like the the thing is like an equal equality with everything else as well. Whether somebody's you know washing the dishes or sweeping the floor or doing this or this or this, the role um, there's no. You know, uh, um, category of this role's better than this, or the ego of this, 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 or this. So, I guess sort of, yeah. So, I, I mean, I've had that state of mind with this. So it's like, even sometimes people say, "Oh, wow, the picture you painted for our center or something." People have so many good experiences with it, and then I, I think, "Oh, where was that? You know, what center?" And I sometimes I <laughs> even look at the picture. And I think, "Did I paint that?" You know? <laughs> Oh. <laughs> really, some some I've seen like that, and of course the, the feeling is that I guess when you're the in the state of being an instrument while doing it, it's like that's something. Um, the energy of doing that it really it means that if somebody looks at that, they're not going to remember you. They're going to remember that divine source. Yeah. So that was the aim of this, anyway. It's like okay, if I can do something to create something, it's going to pull someone to that divine source, and then. They get inspired to use their specialities with that. Then it goes on from that point. So that was always like the. Also, I find that really fascinating. That um, it's not like an, you you first of all protect yourself from becoming egoistic. Let's say <laughs> that's yeah. one way of really yeah. very. It's a very good way to do that. Is you just pass on the thank yous to the divine source who's using you as a channel and as an instrument. And uh, but the great thing is, you know, it is you who's bringing this across to these thousands of people and inspiring them. <laughs> and actually, they say that when work comes through from the 
higher channels and the higher energies, then you'll always find that they've got very high vibrations and you'll always inspire people um, in its way because it's got these high vibrations included, involved, you know, in creating that. Oh, thank you so much, David. David, you've been an absolutely fascinating interviewee. <laughs> Great. And, you know, just being part of this, uh, it's taught me so much. And also uh, learning about your background. I believe it's been a really, really interesting story. I would love to read your biography one day mm. <laughs> and about all your wonderful experiences. Is there a last minute message you'd like to share to our listeners who are listening right now and may wish to find out a bit more about the Brahma Kumaris? Oh, last message. Um, <laughs> good question. Um, well, I think to really find yourself, you have to look deep inside yourself. And I, and I, I guess sort of, yeah, to, to search out a place or a Raj Yoga Center or a place where they can get some of this knowledge of really in detail. And, and I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure that, um, once we hear knowledge of the self as a soul, our part as a soul, the time we're in, this particular time now because so many things are happening to really be stable inside, to be peaceful inside, content, and all this is very important at this time to find that. Absolutely. And of course, meditation also helps you in terms of personal development, developing, uh, you know, all the wonderful characteristics that we all kind of strive towards. Um, but it tends to, fi you find that by um, walking the meditation path, uh, this becomes easier and sometimes even quite automatic. Yeah, yeah, to, and it's like to, you know, my feeling is the more we can be in meditation, in what e everything we're doing, the better we're going to be, better we're going to be responsive, uh, res res how we respond to situations, to world situations, to dramas, different calamities, all these things we're able to remain very stable and and centered in that in the, at that time, so that's that's important now as well. Well, thank you so much, David. You've been absolutely wonderful. It's been a pleasure speaking to you, and uh, you have, of course, tuned into the one and only Honey Calaria on the Midday Musty Show on New Sound Radio ninety two FM. I've been speaking to David Kalowski from Australia, and of course, so we've been getting a wonderful insight into his spiritual journey and how he came into studying about the Brahma Kumara teachings. Stay tuned in because you'll be finding out a lot more about this wonderful organization.